where are we going today? We're we're gonna we're gonna keep on going with uh, so la- at the end of last class, um, we talked about Izawa's theorem, which I think is is a pretty cool theorem. Um, it's uh, it's kind of useful. I mean, it kind of it, it it's it gives you the lay of the land. I think um, as long as you are cognizant of what the uh, preconditions kind of imply about the actual existence, right? So it's like if it exists, then 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 you may as well have labor augmenting technical change. Okay, so let's, uh, yeah, so, well, let me just sync up the slides here. There's, there's Robert Solo. I have a picture of him for some reason. I think this, this I think Marla had pictures and I, 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 I inherited slides from her. So these are, a lot of these, these slides are based on Marla's slides. They, they evolve over the years, but, uh, you know, really the, a lot of the credit does go to, to Marla, uh, at least for the good stuff, right? So, um, yeah, that's Robert Zola. Uh, he might not be alive anymore. I'm not sure if there, there should be a date after that dash there. But, uh, you know, because he, he would be 97 or 96 probably at this point. So I I think he might have. Or no, Ken Arrow, Ken Arrow died a couple of years back. I don't know about Zola, but, you know, he'll live for... In our hearts, he'll live forever. Um, okay, so let's let's speed. Okay, so he's just like, yeah, that's that's impressive. That's impressive. Let's, yeah, I mean, maybe I'll get to a hundred. Um, yeah, awesome. Uh, okay, so where where did? Okay, so let's see. Um, where does Abbas theorem go? I guess it's farther forward. Yeah, maybe put, okay, here we go. So that's just Zawa's theorem. So just the only thing you want to keep in mind is that this precondition about, first of all, the precondition of it's exactly constant after some capital T is a little bit silly because you would only, that would only really happen if you started there, um, but it can be weakened to it's approximately constant, okay? Uh, but then even that approximately constant growth rate assumption um, on these on these sort of aggregates, um, it has some bite in the sense that it will preclude uh, cases where there is not a constant growth rate or the, there's a sort of a non-existence of a, a sort of stable equilibrium. Okay, so um, yeah, so that that's sort of the key there, and then and then the other thing is you know just noting that um, with Cobb Douglas, it's kind of like everything works anyway for other reasons. Okay, um, but uh, Okay, uh, but let's think about the let, let's let's sort of map out the space by looking at the case where it does break a case where it does break down. Okay, um, and that's going to be CES. All right, so yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna look at CES. Okay, and we're in particular we're gonna look at um, the different types of economic uh, technological growth that you can have driving things in the background. Okay, so uh, first I guess let me. So in the homework, I, I think I gave you a CES problem on the homework, right? Um, yeah. So the CES production function. Okay. So remember last time I was I was fidgeting around with like what do we have epsilon? Do we have rho? How does it look? I'm gonna just make it look the same as the homework. Okay. Um, I, I'm just looking at the homework here on the side. So in the homework, when we when we uh, so this is gonna be like the CES case. Um, in the homework, when we had constant elasticity of substitution. Uh, well, okay, so so we in the homework we we don't have any technological growth, um, so I'll, I'll put in, uh, I think, KLA, KL, whatever. Um, those are our arguments, okay? Capital labor and technology, and so now, okay. So the question is, where do we put A? Right? That's that's the going to determine sort of what is driving our technological growth. Okay. I mean, first of all. You know, tech, to all technology is, is just the production function is changing. Okay, um, there doesn't always have to be a single real variable that de- that describes technology. Te- technology could be a tuple, it could be a triple, it could be anything, basically, right? So, but for the most part, I'm going to be thinking about okay, we have some A that's going up. Are we going to stick it on the front? Are we going to stick it attached to capital? Or are we going to attach it to labor? Okay, so um, let's let's attach it to capital first and see how that works out. And then we can try other stuff. Okay, um, so here the exponent in the inside is one minus rho, and then on the outside is the counter 
opposing exponent, uh, one over one minus rho, that gives you constant returns to scale still. Um, and then when rho goes to one, obviously things go a little haywire, um, but they do it kind of in both directions at the same time so that it turns into Cobb Douglas. Okay, and that's why we have alphas here um, as the weights happen in. Um, that's why we have these alphas, because these in fact become exactly those alpha exponents when you take the limit, okay, the L'Hopital's rule. Okay, um, Okay. so that's, that's this is gonna be our uh, uh, production function, and then you know later on we'll look at, okay, what if you put A here, attach it to L, make it labor augmenting rather than capital augmenting, and what happens if you put it out on, uh, on front, okay? Um, yeah, all right, so then, uh, well, so we're, I'm not gonna go through and solve everything, okay, partially because you are going to slash have already done a bit of that on the homework by, by solving the case without technological growth. But we can do, uh, I don't know, it's not really like unit analysis, but it's like growth rate analysis where we kind of get the, we, 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 see, we, we just look at growth rates and try and figure out what's gonna happen. Kind of eyeball what's gonna happen or, or are things gonna go bad, okay? Um, now, to do that, we do need to think about our uh, rule of uh, law of motion for capital. Okay, so here, it's, I mean, it's the same thing. It's just, you know, take output, takes a fraction S of that, invest in capital, and then you got uh, some depreciation. Okay, and this is just the aggregate, okay? Uh, so there's no effective depreciation or anything like that, okay? It's just, this is just given, okay? Um, yeah, and then, uh, so we can say, okay, well, whatever happens, okay, let's think about the growth rate of capital, okay, and ponder that. Um, okay, well, if, if the growth rate of capital, so we're gonna get at, I mean, you know, it's gonna be S of KLA over K minus delta, all right? Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's it. I mean, I just divided by K and uh, the delta is proportional. Okay, so then the question is what's, what's F over K or Y over K, right? Remember, this is y here. This is this is output, right? The question is, what is that? Well, that's actually not so bad because you know it's it's basically because it's it's constant returns to scale. You know the the k is going to kind of end up wind its way up inside each of these terms, right? Because you get the k dividing outside. You factor it in through here, and you're going to get a one minus rho. But then when you factor it in to the inner parentheses, that cancels out. And so you'll just basically dividing this thing by k is like dividing each of these a k terms and the l term by k, which is exactly the the homogeneity of degree one, right? That's that's the same thing, right? Where you can factor it in inside basically. Okay, so um, you know I could say okay one over k. I could go step by step and and show you that you know as as you go through the the rows cancel basically, and you're just going to get the divisor here. Okay, so let's let's pretend we did that. Okay, so if that happens, then we're going to get S times some big CES monster. Okay, so, but it's going to look basically the same, except the inner uh, factors are divided by K. So in the, in the first one, the K is just going to cancel that existing K, so we'll get A. And in the second one, uh, it's going to be that L, but then divided by K, and then everything else is basically the same. One minus rho, and then don't forget about Delta over here, okay? Um, yeah, so that's that's just like, you know, kind of using that homogeneity or constant returns to scale. We can say, okay, we'll kill off this K by dividing the K, K there and divide K here and we get L over K, all right? So that's um, that's what we get, all right? So, th so this is saying the growth rate of K is something that's a function of basically A, K, and L, all right? Um, and then, so th from here, then we might say, okay, well, whatever happens, we're gonna to wanna to end up in a BGP, a balanced growth path. Um, and if that's true, then the growth rate of capital is gonna be constant, right? It's gonna be some positive, presumably positive constant, but it should be a constant, right? Even, every, even when we add growth and stuff like that, we still wanna have a constant growth rate. It's just gonna be potentially larger because of technology, okay? So this is, you know, in BGP, 
this is going to be some GK. So when I write, you know, of course, this is just the definition of GK. But sometimes when I write it like this, I'm sort of saying, okay, well, th this is a GK that's going to be like a constant, right? So it's like kind of instantiating it, okay? So constant here. Over here, the idea would be things settle down and converge to a constant so as to have some sort of internal consistency. But that's probably not going to happen um, for this reason, which is uh, A is growing, right, continually. And there's really not that much you can do to stop it, right? It's kind of out of control because uh, K is, so K is, is growing somehow, right? We don't know what GK is, but we know it's growing. Um, and it's probably, but so in the, in the case for that technology, this K and the K and L will grow at the same rate and achieve balance, right? And so this would be, in that case, this would be constant, but we do have technology. So you'd actually expect K to be growing faster than L, right? In which case this term would, would go to zero, right? K would, would dominate L and this, this term would go to zero, okay? And then you, but you still have A, right? So the, the, this thing can't counteract A because the best it can do is just go to zero, right? It can't go negative or anything like that. So, so if A is blowing up, that's, there's really nothing this other term can do, um, which is, well, so let's say that happened. Let's say that this went to zero and A uh, kind of went, went to infinity. Then you'd end up with like S, so you'd end up with a, a constant A, right? So th this would converge to like S alpha to the one over one minus rho times A minus delta, okay? This would be GK, right? Um, right, but then that's not good because then GK, the growth rate is growing exponentially, right? So that's a bit weird. That's singularity territory, which we kind of want to avoid for now, all right? Um, so basically, it doesn't work, okay? Um, it, it's it. You don't have a VGP, basically. Okay, so this this is this is what this is the case where, you know, this this falls outside of the purview of Uzawa's theorem because there's no VGP and there's no constant growth rates, right? Because everything just explodes. Um, yeah. So and and the and basically the idea is like if this is a partial, I guess partial converse to uh, Zawa is that, um, you know, at least in the case of CES, you can't have long run capital augmenting technical change, okay? And uh, in a lot of other cases, you can't have it either, okay? And, and bit, pretty much Cod Douglas is one of the few cases where you can, all right? So so that's the thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess the idea is uh, you, there's a there's too much positive feedback with, with labor. And if labor is getting more productive over time, there's no response on the labor side. It just keeps growing every day, okay? Um, and so you don't get any sort of feedback. Whereas with capital, it's like capital gets more productive, so you make more output, so you invest more in capital, and that's more productive. And it's just like, you know, that's it's a feedback that it's too much, and there's no there's not enough decreasing returns to, to dampen it, okay? So, um, yeah. So so that's that's what I would call kind of a, well, it's, it's not a counterexample to Uzawa, because of course, the, is that theorem is, is true, but it's a uh, it's a point where Zawa theorem doesn't apply. Okay, um, yeah. All right. Um, okay, so that's uh, that's a case where it didn't work. Okay, well, let's go through a case just quickly where it does work. All right, um, just so we know that there's all hope is not lost. Okay, um, and that would be you know where you uh, instead. K KLA. I feel like KLA is an acronym for something, but I can't put my because it's not it's not PLA, which is People's Liberation Army. It's not KLM, which is the airline. Um, I mean, it's it's uh, it's obviously an ac acronym for like five different things that we could go on Wikipedia and look it up. But um, I feel like it's something I've encountered before. But let's leave that for another day. Okay, so uh, labor augmenting. Here we're gonna have uh, just same thing except A is now jumped over to uh, the labor side. Um, what's gonna happen? Well, 
In that case, all right, so we can just go through the same steps. Okay, gk is k dot over k, um, which is, you know, f. Internally, I'm thinking king's liberation army, whatever that means. I don't know if we're, are we liberating the king? Are we liberating ourselves from the king? Tough to say. Um, okay, so that's, that's the same thing, basically. And then what's going to differ is, of course, what happens next when we plug in for f. Okay, so now we're going to have alpha. Okay, so we're going to have alpha. We're, okay, we're dividing by k. So, so now this k, where did my cursor go? This k is going to be a 1. Okay, so it's just going to be alpha. And then the second one is going to turn into uh, a l over k uh, to the 1 minus rho, and then all that to the 1 over 1 minus rho, and then delta okay so um, similar looking um, but this one is going to be a little bit more well behaved all right and essentially from this it's like okay well GK should be constant we want to find a BGP what do we need well in this case we can get something at least that seems like it's feasible okay which is that this thing is going to converge to a constant right so that the GK should be equal sort of in the long run to G a all over GA, or sometimes let's write G plus GL, okay, which which often will just end up being written as G plus N. Okay, so so in that case, you can see a clear path forward where K is growing at not, not just that population growth rate, but the population growth rate plus uh, uh, technological growth rate. Okay, and then it turns out we can do that. That's all very doable um, because I don't know what it is, and uh, well, it, it works with. Um, well, we, we kind of already see that it's doable, okay? So, um, and yeah, so the good thing here is unlike before where we had that, we had N plus G over one minus alpha because it was outside, just, I don't know, because of the way the algebra works out, it just comes out as a G, okay? So so also in addition to being kind of feasible and 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 resulting in an extent BGP, it also gives you simpler algebra and then you just get a plus G, all right? So, yeah, so so that'll work, um, and it'll work for other stuff. I mean, you could, you know, you, the I don't know what what else, what else is out there. I know. Um, I mean, CES is kind of the most general production function that we're going to look at, and everything that's interesting is usually a special case of CES. So in this case, that would be Cobb Douglas, as we discussed. Um, linear would be rho equals zero. Okay, uh, you can go to like the so-called AK model by pushing alpha to one and rho to zero. So you get all that. You can get Leontief if you go somewhere, either row, either plus or minus infinity for row. I couldn't tell you which one, um, but Leon, you, you'll get Leontief. In fact, you'll get going to plus or minus infinity with row gives you min and max, and Leontief is the min. Okay, Leontief is like you need to have these proportions, and if you have like a hundred horses and like two people, like the the ninety eight horses are just gonna wander around like eating grass, right? So like. The NTF remembers the min because you, you need to have this proper proportion. The opposite, the max, is uh, tough to say. I don't know. I mean, you could imagine there's max. It's more like you have two inputs that you can kind of do the job with, and you, it's you know, it's, but they can't work together. I don't know. I'm trying to think of a livestock example. You have two types of livestock that don't get along, so you can only use one type. Uh, and so you use the one with more. It's a bit contrived, but there's got to be an example with, with the max. But usually, like the the Leon TF min is is where you see like more reasonable stuff going on. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, so so CES really is the most general thing that we'll look at, um, and and for that kind of stuff, it seems to to work pretty well. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, let's see. Now in terms of, <clears throat> and I kind of go so in the notes. Um, I do this exercise, which is kind of cool. I, I'm not going to go through the whole thing in lecture, just because it's, it's a bit, it's a bit. I don't know, it's, it's algebra intensive, but not really concept intensive as much. Okay, so uh, I'll just I'll just let you guys check it out. But there is some stuff that I want to kind of go through. Okay, so but but um, yeah. So this is the slide 24 in the notes where it says kitchen sink growth. So, so we're just if you're familiar with the phrase throw the kitchen sink at them or everything but the kitchen sink something like that it's like we, you, you just try everything okay so uh here we're doing 
where you're doing all different types of technological growth at the same time and what happens, okay? Um, and the only thing I'll add here is we, we have Z, B, and A, which I'm calling them, are the, the neutral, the capital augmenting, the labor augmenting. And then there's also this Q, which I haven't really talked about yet, but which is kind of interesting in the sense that it's like showing up in a different spot. It's showing up not in the production function, but in the investment function kind of, okay? And so what Q does is it says, well, usually up until now, we've assumed that if you invest one unit, of, like if you give up one unit of consumption, that turns into exactly one unit of investment or of capital in the next instant or period. Uh, what Q is going to do is is amp that up. Okay, so now it's going to say over time, investing one unit uh, in capital is actually going to produce more than one unit of capital. Or like giving up one unit of consumption is going to uh, give you more and more capital. Okay, so it's called it's like um, like investment augmenting technical change. Okay. Um, and so it's like, you might think that, well, okay, well, it's just a normalization factor, so why would it matter? Okay, and it is true that if, if it was the case that turning, you know, giving up one unit of consumption uh, gave you two units of capital, and it was just a constant two over time, yeah, that wouldn't matter because you could just redefine your units and, and cancel it out, or you could just, you know, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't make a substantive difference because the units of capital really aren't specified in these, in these kinds of models, okay? So there's, there's kind of a degree of freedom there. Um, but if it's growing over time, then that actually does change things, okay? Because the way you kind of, I mean, it changes the growth rates and things like that, okay? Um, yeah, so, that, so that's kind of interesting to throw that in there too. Um, and, you can, and you can see how uh, in that case, well, yeah, so in that case, you actually have to, um, you, uh, how do we do this? So so I do it, I don't do it in the general case. I, I take all the different types of growth, kitchen sink, and say, okay, well, what if it's if it's Cobb Douglas, okay? And then like, how do things pan out, all right? So first of all, we know in Cobb Douglas that you can always combine, any, anything on the production function side, you just kind of smush over uh, either into one or the one or the other place. In this case, I've switched it over to labor augmenting because we know that kind of works well, um, and then just leave it there as like a, a a combination factor of all that stuff. Uh, and then the the Q, the investment augmenting technical change that you have to deal with a little bit separately, and 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 you have to um, normalize both capital and investment in a certain way. But it's it's possible, and you can kind of make everything work out. Okay, so that's. That's that's um, what's well, an example of okay. Well, we need you know we need to, what's we need to find out what's the right normalization factor. Okay, um, so it's another example of sort of how do you go through that process. Okay, and and as you know, again, it's it's always the it's always a, a matter of just doing growth rate algebra and making sure thing like just like what we did here to figure out whether it worked or not with CES is find the growth rate of certain things and make sure that they end up constant. Make sure that like ratios that appear in those things that should be constant are balanced. Uh, in terms of growth, and then you should be all set, okay? And you can kind of infer your normalization factor from that, okay? Um, yeah. All right, so that's, that's basically what we got. Um, and then the, the only other thing really we need to do is, um, you know, we, we went through solo, we went through solo with, um, population growth, okay, but just you know, you know, just uh, doing solo with technological growth, okay. All right, so like solo plus technology, okay. In the sense of like actually solving it, all right. So we kind of we've kind of been dancing around that a little bit, but solving it, it it's going to be very similar to what to what we had before, though. Okay, so um, and we're going to do it with. Uh, labor augmenting technical change. Okay, so we're gonna say y is f of, so we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna write it like this, right? So we're gonna say y is f of k a l, right? So this, this is saying, okay, we have some general production function f, but then like the, since we write it like this, you know, we're already saying that the, the technical change is labor augmenting. Okay, so f is just, is a function of two variables that has all the properties that we that we were talking about before, and then we're like applying that function specifically here, okay? But we're still leaving f general, okay? And, and we're, we're still 
assuming all the same properties about homogeneity, okay? Um, okay, so that's that's really kind of what that's, I mean, that's, that's basically it. And then um, if you think about what uh, what normalization are we going to use? Well, we, we kind of already saw with CES that, you know, this, you know, this this is sort of the critical ratio, K over AL in this case. All right, so we're, we're going to use, instead of just L, we're going to use A times L, okay? Uh, so just like before, when there was L here, we, we normalized by L, now we're going to normalize by AL, okay? So that's going to mean like Y over AL um, is going to be F, K, AL, or AL, okay, and then because we're uh, homogeneous with degree one, again, we can we can factor through, okay, and so this is going to be K over AL, comma one, all right, so the same thing except just with an A now, um, okay, and then we're going to, we're going to define this as like little f of K over AL, all right, so, uh, so yeah, um, now I, I haven't introduced lowercase variables yet, but that you know we have introduced lowercase f. But naturally, we're also going to want to introduce normalized lowercase variables um, to correspond here. So sometimes, um, let's see, what did, did I? So yeah, I mean, like last time, I remember when we did this. So, so I mean, th this is going to give us basically the same answer as last time. But last time. I use the tilde. Sometimes I'm gonna not use the tilde, and I'm just gonna use lowercase y, but like redefine it, okay? Because I just want I just don't want to write tildes all the time, okay? So in this case, we're just gonna define lowercase y to be y over al, lowercase k to be k over al, okay? So it's just like oftentimes when we get into these more advanced normalizations, we're just gonna redefine stuff rather than writing a bunch of tildes all over the place, okay? So just makes our lights a little bit easier. So just remember that Y isn't necessarily always per capita. It's sometimes just like whatever our normalization is. Okay, little Y. Okay, so in this case, that's gonna mean, okay, well, and just, just kind of moving down, that means that Y is equal to, you know, this thing on the far right here, which is just F of little K. All right, so it's just kind of the same thing that we would see, uh, but because we define new variables, it has a different, slightly different meaning, okay? Um, all right, and so, so that's a production function. Only other thing we need to do is, is that law of motion for capital, which is gonna give us kind of the whole ball game here. Uh, think about what's the growth rate of our new, newly defined little k, all right? And that's just gonna be, kind of use the quotient rule, growth rate of capital K, growth rate of A, growth rate of L, all right? So that's, that's gonna be our growth rate there. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and then and then so what the growth rate of uh, capital K, right? So let me just I don't know should I write it. Remember the growth rate of capital K is uh, S. Uh, I guess I'll call it Y for now minus the 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 rate of change of capital K rather is S Y minus delta K, right? So um, yeah, so so then. Uh, we can do that, right? So then we're gonna have, you know, I'll kind of write it out here. Growth rate of K. Um, we know the growth rate of A. Well, I didn't say it explicitly, but we're assuming in the background that A is just this, you know, exponential process, just like population growing at rate G. Okay, so these are simple. These are just G and N, okay? Um, yeah, all right, and then, uh, and actually here, you know, we don't have to plug in for Y if we don't want to, right? Because uh, we can just, you know, so this is gonna be, just to simplify a bit more, this is gonna be S times Y over K minus delta minus G minus N. So it's gonna be like minus delta plus G plus N combined there. Okay, so we can just leave it at that. And uh, it doesn't really matter exactly what um, what y what the production function is at this point, okay? And then and then because we defined the normalization factor on y and k to be the same a, al right or one over al, uh, then this is just going to be you know s 
times little y over here. So divide top and bottom by al, and you're going to get that. Same thing here. Okay, so yeah, and then and then remember this is that growth rate k. All right. Um, yeah, and then the last thing we do is just uh, multiply the k back, and so we're going to k dot is s times y minus delta plus g plus n times k. All right. Um, and then the, and the very last thing we do is just note that y is just f of k, right? So this is s f of k minus delta plus g plus n times k. All right, so so that's our that's our law of motion. Okay, um, same thing we same thing we had last time, except this is just g instead of g over one minus alpha. Okay, just slightly simpler with with if you just go ahead and directly assume labor augmenting by sort of invoking Uzawa's theorem. Okay. All right, so that's it. Um, from there, we can do everything. Uh, we can we can do graphical analysis. Um, same, it's going to look exactly the same, right? As we it, as we've seen before. The only difference is the technical, you know, sort of algebraic value of that depreciation line is going to be, you know, that new is not going to have the one over one minus alpha, but like exactly the same in terms of the interpretation, everything like that. Okay, so. Um, yeah, I guess that's, uh, I think that's it basically for solo. Um, you guys got any issues with that? Questions? No, you're good? All right. That's what I thought. Um, okay, so then what to do now? Okay, so like, uh, yeah. Um, Okay, we have a slight LaTeX error in the slides, but I'll fix that. Um, at this point, I mean, so so now that we're kind of like through kind of the the intro solo, I think we sh we have a, you know, this 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 gives us a good idea of just how to work with uh, relatively mechanical continuous time models. Okay, um, the next step is going to be thinking about optimization, right? Uh, and, and going to, more towards this this Ramsey model, okay? Um, you guess there's some, I mean, there's some stuff I do want to get out of the way in terms of working with continuous time, especially with differential equations, okay? Um, and I guess from there we can, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll do that and then, we, and then we can transition to Ramsey. Okay, and so this and this is good. this is stuff all at the end of uh, basically at the end of lecture I don't know, lecture two, which is the the solo uh, lecture. Okay, um, so we'll do we'll do this and then we can move on to uh, the to Ramsey stuff. All right, um, and then I guess the other thing is in terms of what we're going to cover farther in the future. Um, I do want to have some computational component here in terms of like actually computing uh, output from the models that we're studying here because most, I mean, you know, if, if you do macro, which I understand that most will not, uh, you're probably going to be computing these models. I mean, you're probably not just going to be doing all highfalutin theory. Um, you're going to be computing stuff. Partially because that's just like the field demands, and partially because that's like what, more kind of what we do here at Pitt, and, and really in most places. Um, so, so that's one thing. But then, if you don't do macro, which is awesome too, uh, then you're probably going to be computing stuff anyway. It, maybe you're not solving a huge structural macro model, but maybe you're solving a huge structural micro model, or maybe you're just you know doing experimental. Maybe you have uh, you know at the end of the day, there's a really high chance that you're going to probably need this stuff. Um, <clears throat> And uh, yeah, and, and if it's on the more empirical side, then actually there's a lot of overlap, I think, um, between, especially the, the level of tools, there's a lot of overlap there. Uh, so I, yeah, I mean, I think almost surely anything we do here in computation will be useful in some way. Unless you're, are, if you're already like 100% computational master, then I guess there's nothing I can teach you, but um, you know, probably I'm guessing uh, for, for, for most people, this is, 
it'll be stuff that's generally helpful, not just helpful for macro. Um, okay, and I think um, I don't know if it's better to do in, in if we're in a remote setting. Is it is it? I, I I was thinking maybe it's better in the sense that you can kind of see you know, by, by computing the out, output of models. I th think you often achieve a better understanding of them. Okay, uh, by seeing specific outcomes, by being able to in real time kind of tweak things and see what happens, um, and perform sort of like mini. Exp theoretical experiments uh, I, I think it helps okay so I don't, I don't know if that's better or worse in a, in a um, remote setting I, but you know the computational stuff is stuff that it, it kind of it's already remote like if, if you're you know, if you're doing stuff on a, a Python notebook in the cloud it's already kind of inherently remote so it's it's no harder or easier okay so um, <clears throat> yeah so we're going to do that I guess at some point I'll, I'll, I'll do a uh, you know, sort of intro tutorial, and then we can we can move into computing, you know, solo or or Ramsey or whatever we end up doing. Okay, um, yeah, so that's the plan. Uh, all right, so so now um, we're gonna do a little Diffy Q. All right, uh, so let's start a new page here. Um, imagine you guys have seen Diffy Q in some form or another at some point. Um, we're not gonna use the most advanced stuff from that. Okay, most most everything we're going to be doing is relatively simple Diffy Q. So I can just cover. I can just kind of cover it here, right? Um, and and then so 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 we'll be basically self-contained in that sense. All right. Uh, okay. So so we're doing some Diffy Q. Okay. And the reason, I mean, now think about it. We 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 have been doing Diffy Q, right? We have been doing you know k dot equals some function of k. That's a differential equation. Right, we've been thinking about steady states and just kind of drawing graphs and, and thinking about that. But like, if, in principle, we could uh, solve those differential equations and come up with explicit functions for like k of t equals blah. All right. Now, one of the pro the problem is that in almost every case, there's no closed form solution, at least that I know of, for this kind of stuff. But you know, maybe I don't know if you do some kind of path integral thing. I don't. Know, maybe you could do it. I'm not sure. Um, but for us, we're gonna we are gonna need sort of um, this not just for thinking about solo, but also once we go towards Ramsey, then we we actually do need to occasionally solve uh, relatively simple Diffie Qs as as part of the process. Okay. Um, all right. So what 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 are we gonna do here? So the way I'm gonna set it up is the I'm gonna use like different variables for like this sort of just um, pure math side of things, so we know that we're like just we're just thinking about like sort of like a mathematical setting here and then we're going to apply that later on to other stuff. Okay, so what I'm going to say is um, we're going to, so we have some differential, we have some series X, right? Okay, and we're going to describe its motion or its evolution uh, with a differential equation. Okay, that should be an X, sort of a pseudo alpha there. So M times X of T uh, plus B. Okay, so I'm X plus B, so it's like the, what is that? Cal, cal, high school calculus, you probably used M MX plus B or something like that. So, um, yeah, so that's that's the notation we're going to use. All right. Now, um, so this is a differential equation. It could be capital, could be solo, could be anything, right? Uh, it's linear, okay, which maybe differentiates it from, from other stuff, okay? Uh, and so we're just going to kind of study the hell out of this. All right. Now, what, uh, what can we say about it? Well, first, <clears throat> we can say, well, there may uh be a steady state here okay possibly um and or, or i guess i mean if, if we allow so so in this case <clears throat> uh let me think in this case we we are kind of allowing for negative x right so that's the other thing. in solo we're always kind of there's no negative capital there's no imaginary capital none of that uh in this case <clears throat> we're kind of we're, we're just dealing in, in like real not R plus, we're just dealing in R. Okay, so so we could go negative. Um, and so if you think about, <clears throat> uh, you know, we could draw the same uh, sort of, I don't know, it's, it's not a phase diagram, it's a evolution diagram or something like that. We could draw that, right, in, in this case, uh, and, but again, like, you know, even here, I forgot, this 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 can be in, in R generally. Okay, so let's extend this out a, bit, a little bit to the left. Okay, so it's just, but it's just some, 
linear function, right? Let's let's say for now that um, m is positive and b is negative. Okay, so that means that like you know, this is <clears throat> minus b down here, some linear function, and of course, if m is positive, there's going to be a so this has slope m. There's going to be a, a an intersection point. Okay, which we call x star. Okay, and that's going to be um, it's going to be a steady state. Okay, now it might be stable or unstable, as we'll see, and we'll define what stability means. Uh, but that, but that's going to be a steady state. So if you look at this situation, in fact, you can see if we <clears throat> if we actually started at this, you know, x sub zero. If we started at this point, then well, x dot is positive, right? So we're actually going to move up and keep moving up, right? So so in this case, we would just kind of move up forever, right? Um, so that's not, well, I don't know, it's not, it's, not, it's not anything, it's just what happens, okay? Um, and then in this case, you know, the other way, it's also sort of unstable in that direction as well. Okay, so this is a, just intuitively, for now, we can call it an, an unstable steady state because if you start anywhere off of it, you're just gonna go off in the other direction, okay? Um, all right, so then, uh, yeah, uh, okay, but then, you know, we, we can still think about what, what's the value of that steady state. Well, you know, it's just, it's just where x dot equals zero. Okay, so where, where would x dot equal zero? Well, that's just gonna be minus b over m. Okay, so you just solve x dot equals zero, you get minus b over m. Okay, so that's that's the numerical value of that uh, steady state, okay? Now, and then the, the other thing I'll say is, you know, we, we just to say that it's not inevitable that this thing is unstable is, okay, you could, you could do the opposite and have some b here. I guess this is this is really not minus b. This is b. It's just b is negative. Okay, so you can have some other world, right, where you have uh, intercept b slope m <clears throat> with some steady state. Now here m is negative, so the steady state, and b is positive. So so either way, the steady state is is positive. Okay, um, but you know if you're if you're down here, <clears throat> uh, remember this is x dot this is x. Uh, your x, your 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 below steady state, the x dot's positive. Okay, you're gonna move towards steady state. So in this case, you're gonna move towards steady state. So that's a stable steady state. Okay, that's what's unstable. All right. So um, something. Well, you can see, you know, it, it it has to do with m basically, right? It has to do with that slope. Okay, and 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 in particular, the slope at so that so now this is a linear case. So the slope at the steady state is the same as the slope everywhere, right? But but in particular, it, it really comes down to what's the slope or looking around steady state in, in a more general setting. Okay, are you passing through it from you know in this case, are you passing upwards through steady state so the slope is positive, or are you passing downwards the slope is negative? That's going to determine the stability because it's going to say okay, if you're on the left hand side, you're low. Uh, is the slope negative or positive? If it's positive, it's going to push you back towards steady state. If it's negative, it's going to push you away. Okay, so essentially, it's the slope of this function around steady state that's going to tell you about stability. Okay, and we'll see that. All right. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then uh, yeah, I mean, and then the other thing we can do is think about a solution to this equation. Okay, so here, I mean. Is there? A con I don't know if there's. A con can I do a constructive proof? Um, probably. Yeah, I mean, I, I could I could try to do that one of those constructive proofs, but or I could just say like here's a here's an answer and let's check. I guess and check. I guess you would call it. All right, so let's let's just do guess and check for now. Um, Okay, so, uh, and then, what? Am, yeah, so I, I guess I'm calling it, I'm just gonna call it x of t, all right? So, so in this case, uh, our guess, okay, is something like this, all right? And basically we're saying, you know, this, remember this is, this is x star, as you can see, right? We're just saying it's x star plus some exponentially growing or shrinking term. Uh, that exponent is m, okay, which is kind of, what we would expect, you know, here that uh, you know, if, if there was no b, you know, we've seen before, I think that 
this is an exponentially growing or shrinking uh, function with with uh, exponent m. Okay, so we know that m should be in here, and we'll see that that it has to be. Um, and then uh, we know that we kind of should when we can at least in the case where it's stable and it converges, we should end up at steady state, right? So that's why we're adding in that component. Um, and then d is a scale factor, which which is going to be determined by the initial condition. Okay, so but what I mean, first thing we need to show is that this thing actually satisfies that differential equation for any d. Okay, and then we're going to determine what is d based on x zero, that initial condition. Okay, so um, let, let's I'm going to call this x g for like guess. Okay, that's what that's what I have in the notes. Um, just to differentiate it from like other x's. Okay. Um, so we can calculate uh, the derivative, okay, and then plug it in. Okay, so the derivative of that guess function, okay, so this is just like a guess, right, um, that we have. So that derivative is going to be what? So the that constant term is going to just disappear. So we're going to have d, we're going to get an m out front from like a chain rule sort of thing, and then x, the exponent is its own derivative. Okay, so this is going to be dm e to the mt. Okay. Um, all right, we're, now we're going to take those two things and plug them into our, our Diffie Q up top. Okay, so then we have d m e to the m t. That's uh, x dot. All right, and then we have m times x. Okay, so m times x is going to be what? It's going to be minus b plus d m e to the m t. Okay, and then also at the end we also, we have a, a plus b. Okay, so that's just plugging in, um, and you can see well the dm e to the mt is gonna it's on both sides it cancels. There's a minus b and a plus b on the right side, so this is just zero equals zero or whatever. Check. So that satisfies the equation, the the initial Diffie Q that we started with uh, up here. All right, so that means it works, and it's also for any d. Okay. Uh, so that scale factor is still indeterminate, all right? Um, <clears throat> and that, so that's that's where we have to use our initial condition, right? So that x at time zero is equal to some x zero, okay? And, and I mean, that maybe we should have that sort of as part of the formulation of this Diffie Q is like this is our whole our whole initial assumption is that there's a differential equation that follows this path and it starts here, okay? So that's like a complete specification. All right, so. Um, that's going to give us d. So now, all we have to do is say, uh, you know, so like, so we we know that this thing satisfies the Diffie Q, and then we just have to say, okay, well, what is x g at zero? Well, that's going to be minus b over m plus d. Okay, and that that exponential term is going to be a one because it's about t equals zero. Okay. Right, and then we're saying that this should be equal to x sub zero. Okay, so x sub zero is just like a number. Okay, that's where we start. All right. Okay, so that and that's that's x sub zero, and so that means that you know inverting, you know, we want to find d. So this says that d is equal to x sub zero plus b over m. Okay, which is also because b over m is minus x star our steady state this is x zero minus x star okay so the difference between where you start and steady state which is we'll see it, it kind of makes sense okay all right so that's um that's d and now, now we basically have it right okay now we can say okay our x like the actual answer <clears throat> so i'll drop the g is uh minus b over m plus that d now we know is x0 plus b over m times e to the mt. Okay. Now, we can also sub in for x star. Okay, and I think, I mean, that's much more intuitive, I think. This says that it's, looks like this. Um, So we sub in for x star for that first term, <clears throat> minus b over n is, is just x star. And then uh, the second one, x zero minus x star. Okay, so this means that, you know, here you can kind of see how it, 
how it plays out, which is that, and, and think about think about first the, the stable case <clears throat> where m is negative. Okay, so if m is negative, that second term is, is a transient. It's just decaying, it dies out eventually, and you end up at x star, your steady state, which makes sense. Uh, at t equals zero, okay, then, you're, then you just have x star plus um, x zero minus x star, which ends up is just x zero, okay, by sort of the fact that we, we when we solve for d, that, that sort of ensures that. Okay, so we start at x zero. There's that transient term that exponentially decays us to um, the eventual steady state. Okay, so, uh, you know, we got some steady state, x star, we got x zero, and it's just gonna look like this, exponentially decaying, right? Um, it could be the other way around. It, you know, if, if you started, <clears throat> I guess this should, this, this should be a x sub zero. So if, if you started low, you know, that uh, that x zero minus x star term is going to be negative. Okay, and so then this would look more like that. Okay, so like that. All right, so you're going to, whatever way you start, you're going to converge to x star exponentially. Um, Okay, that's good. Uh, so that's, but this is negative m, right? Now with positive m, you know, you still start at x zero, but then you just kind of go out to infinity. Okay, and so the, the other way to, to sort of factorize this is, um, is to think about it, is you, so you can refactor this as x zero times e to the mt plus um, sorry, x star times uh, one minus. Let me make sure that's right. X star one minus yeah one minus e to the mt. Okay, so in, in that formulation, you you can see like when m is zero, like the, then it's sort of, sort of a weighting between x zero and x star. So when m is zero, the the thing in brackets on the right is zero. And the the e to the mt is one, so you're at x zero. As m goes to infinity, then you converge over to x star. Right, so that uh, that's in the m negative case. Okay, now in the m positive case, um, well, yeah, in the m positive case, you should really think about just like this this one here. Okay. Um, oh yeah, okay, but sorry. So here, here's what I'll say. In the m negative case, I think this is the most intuitive way in some sense is that your weighting starts from all on x0 and then shifts to all on x star. In the m positive case, I think it's, it's, it's more intuitive to think about it as like x0 plus something. Okay, you're starting somewhere and you're not going, you're not converging anywhere, you're just going off to infinity or negative infinity. Um, and so uh, in that case, <clears throat> you can write it as like x0 plus something, right? And you, it's essentially taking that that original term that we had and adding, subtracting x zero, okay? And let me think. What are you gonna get? Subtract x zero. I think you're gonna get this. Uh, Let's see. So as uh, mt, I think that's right. Okay. So you're gonna start. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So so yeah. I don't know. Um, maybe this isn't so intuitive. But you're gonna start at x zero, and then as t goes to infinity, this term on the right is gonna explode. Okay. Um, and you're gonna go off. Uh, in that direction. Now, uh, okay, so I guess this is um, right. So, but the key, I guess, okay. So here, here's the thing: is in the in the positive m case, right? The direction that you go off in is not predetermined, and in fact, the direction that you go off in is is purely a function of whether you start above or below a steady state, right? <clears throat> so you, you, you're diverging, right? So you're, 
uh, you're not converging like in the first case. You're diverging, and you might go high or low, depending, right? And you, you know, we saw <clears throat> up here whether you go high or low ends up being just you know, did you happen to start below x star, or did you happen to start above x star, and you just diverge in either direction, depending on where you started, okay? And so here you can see that's kind of encoded algebraically, okay? Is you start, you, you always start at x zero, okay? If, if t is zero, that that this term disappears. Um, e to the mt minus one, even if the minus one is, is exploding when, in, in the case where m is positive, and then which direction you explode in is determined by the sign of this thing. So whether you start your x zero is above or below x star, right? So this is saying if your x zero is above x star steady state, you're gonna go up towards infinity as we saw before. If your x zero is below x star, then you're gonna diverge downwards towards minus uh, infinity. Okay, so that's just sort of I didn't realize it at first, but that's that's just sort of algebraically encoding what we saw uh, up top graphically. Okay, um, yeah. So that's, I mean, that's sort of the, the exhaustive uh, solution of this linear case. Okay, which is which is relatively simple. Um, and uh, yeah, and and so then and so so what we've learned is okay, you know, I mean, the, the most important thing is just stability. Okay, we've seen that essentially <clears throat> stability is, it's stable if and only if m is negative, okay? Uh, if m is zero, okay, then you're in this sort of weird space, okay? If, if m is zero, then just going back up to the, the original supposition, then it's x dot equals b. Well, that's actually very simple. It just, x is a linear function of time, right? You just integrate that x is, is b times t, or it's, it's x zero plus b times t. So that's that sort of weird knife edge. It's just like, it's it's just kind of doing this, all right? Or that, you know, whatever the sign of n is, okay? So that's um, not stable, but it's not like exponentially diverging. It's just linearly diverging. Um, but we, we would say, you know, you have to be strictly negative for stability. And that, that knife edge case is kind of interesting, but we're, we're not gonna call it stable, okay? Um, <clears throat> all right, so that's, yeah, so that, that's, that's pretty much it. So now the next thing we want to do is, is take this as sort of inspiration and go nonlinear. Okay. All right. So then we say, okay, well that was good, but not everything is linear. Um, even solo is not linear. Okay. And so we're going to say, what if we have X dot of T is some G function of x of t. All right, so we, we have x of t, and then we have some g mapping. So so in the case above, g of you know z or whatever is equal to mx plus b, but in general, g could be any number of things, okay? Um, and so here, uh, let's, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm going to draw it as just positive, but you know, of course, again, x x could be like positive or negative. Um, but you know, uh, in the, so so before you know it's just some linear function, but now it's like well maybe it looks like this, right? And it has three points where it intersects with uh, the origin, and maybe it goes up or down at the end. I don't know, but um, in general, g can be some complicated function. Okay. Um, all right, and so then. What do we? What can we say? Well, we can say there is, there are steady states, okay, potentially, maybe not, but maybe there are, and maybe there are multiple, uh, where g of x star equals zero, okay. So that would be these points here. In this case, there's three, okay. Um, that's one thing, okay. So no, so that's like. So x star now is not a specific object. It's a, a stand-in for one of the steady states, okay? Um, we're going to assume, okay, yeah, g, differentiable, continuous, everything. You know, we, we're not going to be uh, too general in that dimension, okay? So we're going to assume it's differentiable and continuous, at least around the steady states, but let's just say everywhere, okay? Um, <clears throat> all right, and then we're going to think about... Uh, you know, kind of what are the dynamics around these steady states, okay? And so the basic idea of what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, well, you know, zoom in on this region. Well, if you zoomed in on that region, then it would actually look 
pretty much like what we had above. I, I, you know, as you zoom in, you know, kind of Taylor expansion style, it's going to look kind of linear as long as it's differentiable. Uh, and so we can just kind of treat it like that in that neighborhood because you know we are continuous time, so we, we're only making these small continuous evolution movements. Okay, and so you can do that if you're jumping. You know, then who knows? But like if, if we're moving continuously, we can kind of this is a valid approach. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, and so the, the the approximation sort of algebraically is something like, you know, it's like x of t. All right, so now we're thinking about what's, uh, uh, you know, what's the Taylor approximation here for uh, x of t. So we're, we're doing a Taylor approximation of g with respect to x. Okay, so it's not time, we're not doing time. We're doing g with respect to x at a given time. Okay, so that's going to be, uh, that's going to be g of x t. All right. Uh, wait. Yeah. So. Okay. I shouldn't write it like this if I'm doing a tail expansion. So, I should write g of x is approximately equal to, you know, like g of uh, x sum x zero plus x minus x zero times g prime of x zero. Okay, so this is a proper Taylor expansion of g with respect to x around some x zero point. This is, this is a little confusing because maybe I shouldn't write x zero, but but it's not like the initial condition, it's just some random point, okay? Um, but let's, let's keep on doing that. And let's say that, uh, in fact, let, let's do it around, let's just, let's just, Skip the BS here and do it around X star. Okay, so we're we're really interested in doing this around the steady states. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump straight to X star. Okay, so we're saying around a, a particular steady state, G of X is approximately equal to G of X star plus X minus X star times G prime of that should be X star. Okay. Um, okay, and so this is cool because well we know that G of X star is zero. Okay, so this is zero. And then, well, let me move this out front for, I don't know, that's how I have it in the notes. Um, G prime of X star times X minus X star. This is univariate. Okay, so these aren't dot products or anything. It's just multiplication, okay? Uh, so it's G prime of X star times X minus X star. Okay, so now this, um, you know, uh, if we think about, uh, the, um, so th this is just sort of like general for g of x. Now we, we can apply this and say, let me, since I'm at the end of the page here, we're at basically at the end of the class, I'll just say, okay, we're gonna apply this, you know, for x of t, okay? So now I'm just saying that like x of t, x dot of t is equal to g of x. Okay, so this is gonna be g, approximately equal to g prime x star. And then this, the only difference is this is x t minus x star. Okay, so I just took that and let's said, and just like applied it to, x dot and x of t, okay? So so this is like our approximate Taylor expansion DBQ, and this is linear, right? This is, you know, m is uh, g prime of x star, which is just a number, right? Remember, it's a derivative, but it's a, it's evaluated at a specific point, so it's just a number. Uh, and then b is uh, g prime of x star um, t uh, times x star, and also there's a minus sign there. Okay, right? And so now you can see, well, remember before the steady state was minus uh, b over m. In this case, if you evaluate minus b over m, you just get x star, which is good because that's that's self-consistent, okay? And then the other thing is that, you know, our critical parameter m is now g prime of x star, okay? So now with this, if you want to think about stability in a nonlinear setting locally, okay, then you say, okay, well, what is g of x? Maybe it's some quadratic function or something like that. In this case, I guess it's cubic. Um, find the derivative. You know, you can do it analytically. Evaluate it at that steady state, and that gives you a thing, like a number, and that tells you whether it's stable. Graphically, all it's saying is, or in that neighborhood, is m negative. Okay, so in this neighborhood here, in the middle steady state, m is negative. So this is stable, and you can see, like, if you were to deviate to the left positive is going to push you back okay so this is gonna oops disaster this is 
going to push you back towards that steady state, whereas these ones are going to push you away. Okay? Um, so the the first and the third steady state are unstable. That second one in the middle is stable. Okay? Um, all right, I'm going to end in a second because I, I, I'm going to... I, I owe you guys five minutes, okay? So, or seven minutes, I guess. But so, so you can see there's uh, unstable, stable, unstable. And the fact that they alternate is not a coincidence. In fact, I mean, just think about drawing a, a line without picking up your pencil, i.e., a continuous line. If you cross up, the next time you have to cross down, and so on, okay? So it's just sort of inevitable that there's going to be <clears throat> alternating stable and unstable steady states because of continuity. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so that's another kind of neat little thing, okay? And then if you think about sort of like, based on where do we start, where do we end up? Well, in this case, you're gonna diverge if you if, if you deviate, out, if you start outside of those bands in between the unstable steady states, you know, you're gonna end up going out to infinity here, but in this region, you're gonna converge to that central steady state. So there's like an island of stability and then it's like, you don't wanna go outside uh, uh, below, low or high. Okay, so, <clears throat> all right, so that's it. Um, uh, yeah, um, we'll probably talk a little bit more about stability, just, just to recap next time, and then um, go into Ramsey, and then maybe some computational stuff, depending on how I'm feeling.